There's an intentional element in all of our experiences. We play an active role, because we don't make things totally up out of nothing. The situations we find ourselves in, to some extent, are shaped by past actions. The past actions provide the raw material from which we, with our present intentions, actually create what we experience right now. Even something as simple as deciding what to focus on, where to put your attention, what to ignore. There's an intentional element there, which means we're always making choices. We're always trying to decide which choice is the, the best choice. And there may be a lot of uncertainty around it, but that's the basic nature of a choice. You choose one thing because you think it's better than something else. You see, even people who don't believe in choices, don't believe in dualities, they're, st they're still making choices. People who believe that everything is determined are still making choices. The Buddha once went to visit some Jains who believed that everything you experienced in the present moment was based on past actions. He said, have you ever noticed that when you're doing your self-tortures that you have a lot of pain, and when you're not doing your self-tortures there's no pain? Which would indicate that what you're doing right now does have a does play a role in what you're experiencing. So what this means is that we're already embedded in a fabric of actions and intentions. Whether we like to think in that way or not, this is the way things are. And you notice when you look at the Buddha's accounts of his own quest for awakening, there were a lot of things he questioned, but the one thing he never questioned was that your actions do have results, and some actions are more skillful than others, i.e. they give better results than others. And deep down inside, that's how we're constantly fashioning our experiences. And so what he decided to do, both as his own path and his way of, his way of teaching the path to others, was to take that intentional element, take the fact that we're constantly making choices, and put it to the best use. Follow through with the idea that there must be a better happiness, and see how far it can go. He developed a sense of dismay, or the way in which you could not really depend on the ordinary pleasures of the world. And he'd had plenty of pleasures to, to choose from. But he realized that in the end it was totally meaningless. These pleasures would just go away and wouldn't leave anything. Many times he'd leave a bad scar in case you'd done unskillful things in order to gain those pleasures. And so he decided to see, is there a way to find pleasures, a way to find a happiness that doesn't change into something else? In other words, a happiness that's not subject to aging, illness, and death, something that's deathless. And so he pursued that question, and he made a number of false starts and went down a number of blind alleys but eventually found that it is possible. That's what his message is all about. It is possible through human effort to find a happiness that doesn't change. Now there's a lot more to total release, total nibbana, than just the fact that it's a deathless happiness. But that's the aspect he explains to get people on the path taking something we're doing all the time, shaping our experience and saying, 
but if you try to shape it in the most skillful way possible, what would that entail? And it turns out it develops a lot of good qualities in the mind. Just that desire to find a happiness that's more lasting, more solid. So that's the beginning of wisdom. The question, what would I do, it would lead to my long-term welfare and happiness. One, it's based on the realization that your welfare and happiness do depend on your actions. And that long term is better than short term. So wisdom is the first quality that's developed here. Second quality is compassion. If you realize that if your happiness depends on other people's suffering, they're not going to stand for it. It's going to have to end. They'll do something to end it. And see, when happiness, it doesn't harm anyone. And you find in order to find that happiness, you have to be generous, you have to be virtuous, all of which are activities that help other people. It's not just that you're neutral in your impact on other people, you're actually out there helping them. It's impossible to pursue the path without helping others, at least to some extent. And so the serious pursuit of happiness involves compassion. The third quality is purity, which you really do have to look at your actions to make sure they don't harm anybody. They don't harm yourself, they don't harm others. This means reflecting on what you're doing. The principle starts out with just your actions on a day-to-day -day level. What you do, what you say, how you think about things. You have to anticipate what the results of your actions are going to be. And if you foresee any harm, you have to say, no, I'm not going to do that. And this is where wisdom comes in again. Some things you'd like to do but are going to cause harm. So you have to be wise in talking yourself out of them. Other things you don't like to do but they're going to be good. They're going to, have to lead to good results, and you have to learn how to talk yourself into doing those things. Learn how to motivate yourself. This, the Buddha said, is an aspect of wisdom. Then when you're doing something, you look at the results that are actually coming out right now. And if you see that any unexpected harm is coming about from your actions, you can stop. If you don't see any harm, continue. Then when the action is done, you have to look at the long-term results. If you realize that you did harm yourself or did harm others, you want to talk it over with someone else who's on the path so you can get some ideas about how not to harm people, yourself or others, in that way in the future. And then you make up your mind that you're not going to repeat that mistake. The Buddha says you develop a sense of shame around the mistake, which is not the unhealthy shame that all the psychotherapists are telling us are bad, is bad for us. It's a healthy shame, i.e. it comes with self-esteem. that that kind of action is beneath you. Then it comes with a sense of compunction. You're realizing that if you repeat that mistake over and over again, you're just adding more and more suffering. There's no point to that. If, however, you look at the action you did and saw that there were no long-term harmful consequences, then you Take joy in the fact that you're on the path. And it's in reflecting on your actions this way you develop purity. The same principle applies to your meditation. When we're sitting here, we're engaged in a kind of karma. We make up our minds we're going to stay with a particular object or stay with a particular theme. Even if it's just the idea that you want to stay with a broad awareness, trying to be as equanimous and non-reactive as possible. That is a choice you're making. Then you hold on to that perception. That too is an activity. Then you want to look at the results. If the results are good, stick with them. 
But you'll find as your concentration develops that there are stages in the concentration. Your sensitivity grows as the mind grows more and more still, and you can pick up on levels of disturbance that you might not have noticed at the beginning. It's like walking into a very bright room. At first your eyes have trouble adjusting so you can't see anything in the room, but then as they do adjust to the light, you begin to notice the objects in the room. And where there seemed to be nothing before, now you realize, okay, there are things in here, things that can get your way. In terms of the concentration, you realize that whatever the state you're in, there's an element of intention there. It's a kind of karma that's going on. And you're holding different perceptions. You may hold a perception of the body, you may hold a perception of the breath. And at first it's just your anchor that enables you to stay here in the present moment. But after all, you begin to realize that your way of perceiving these things may actually still be a disturbance. To begin with, there's the need to adjust the breath so it feels just right. But then when it gets just right, then you don't have to adjust it anymore. Then you just allow your awareness to settle in and be one with the breath. It gives rise to a strong sense of energy. The Pali term is rapture, bitti, which can also mean refreshment, but sometimes it gets overwhelming, in which case you let it go. That doesn't mean you wipe it out. It simply means you're not focused on that. You fo stay focused on the breath, and you try to stay focused on a le level of e energy in the body that's more refined. It's like tuning the radio into a more peaceful station. The radio waves are always there for all the stations. Just the question which ones you're going to tune into. So the movement of the rapture, the movement of the energy, can begin to calm down. You can keep going through the various levels of concentration in this way. I was talking to someone this morning who was of the opinion that concentration meant that you were aware only of one object and you were, everything else was totally blanked out. That's not the case. You can stay with one perception, and other things are there, simply that you're not getting actively engaged with them. This is the kind of concentration you can take with you as you get up and walk around. Say, for instance, that you want to stay with that sense of broad knowing. Okay, there are lots of things that are going to come in and out of that sense of broad knowing, but you're going to maintain your perception. This is what you're going to keep in mind. Or you be aware of the breath. And again, it's, it's not that you're going to block out other things. The other things are happening. It's simply this is the perception you hold on to. You're going to stay with the, the sense of breath in the body. And whichever level of breath energy you find best to focus in on, that's your choice. But what you're doing is you're learning to see that you have these choices in the present moment. You're not totally a victim of whatever is going to come up. Things that come in from the past, it's, they're like the raw materials, but they're not the actual full experience. The full experience has to have an element of intention. But it's through the processes of working with a mind like this that you learn to the, the extent to which you can shape things through your present intentions. In the beginning, this a working hypothesis that you have this ability to shape your experience, and then you test it. as you would with any other working hypothesis. You begin to see what the results are. The ultimate result is a happiness that's beyond space, beyond time. It takes you out of these parameters, takes you out of these dimensions. And a 
happiness. Uh, the Buddha talks about it as the ultimate happiness, largely as a way of getting you to try to go there. In other words, there's more to release than just ultimate happiness. It's good in lots of ways. I think there are over 20 or so different epithets for, for nirvana, all of which focus on one aspect or another, why it's a desirable thing, why it's a desirable goal. But when you hit it, you realize that the epithets don't cover everything. They're just pointers. But everyone who's been there realizes that this is the best thing you can do with this power of intention, is to follow the path that takes you there. So given the fact that we're already st caught in this matrix of actions and results, intentions that lead either to pleasure or pain. What the Buddha is teaching us is we'll learn how to make the most of that. Take the fact that you're making choices and see what happens when you try to make those choices as wise and compassionate and as pure as possible. 